great presenters on the line. Welcome, we have some folks from Tennessee, Connecticut, New Jersey, Nebraska, awesome, I'd love to see. the diversity across the country. I'm just gonna ask you all to mute yourselves just to limit background noise. Let's see, we have folks from Oregon. Georgia, I have some friends right now in Savannah, Georgia, actually. We went for a bachelorette party. I'm very jealous they're sending pictures of Savannah, Georgia and it looks Absolutely gorgeous. Welcome from Arkansas. Hi, Misty. I know Misty. Great to see you all. We'll get started in just another minute. We're so excited to have everybody online today. Welcome from St. Louis, Charlottesville, Virginia. All right, let's get started. We have a really full agenda today. As I said, I'm Tara, I work at the National Girls Collaborative Project and I also help to manage the National Citizen and Community Science Library Network that is through Arizona State University and SciStarter. And we're gonna tell you all about that today and about how you can get involved in Citizen Science and Citizen Science Month, which is coming up in April. As I said, I'm in Philadelphia, but my colleagues are online and they are on from coast to coast, from Florida to New Jersey to Texas and Washington. So we are a multi-coastal national organization. So what are we gonna talk about today? Uh, we'll go a little bit over what the library network is if folks are new and haven't heard about what we're trying to do here. Um, and then Darlene is gonna give you an overview of Citizen Science Month. Caroline is gonna take you through planning and promoting Citizen Science Month in your communities. And then we'll have ample time for questions. So for those who haven't heard of this National Citizen and Community Science Library Network, welcome. You are part of the network by tuning into this webinar. Um, well, we're gonna tell you about the goals of the network, but in order to sign up officially and get our newsletters and access to our resources, visit scistarter.org forward slash library dash network um, and, and complete that sign up form if you haven't done so already. I know we promoted this webinar far and wide, so you might be coming here brand new to citizen science, which is great. If you don't know what citizen science is, it is a global movement to get anyone and anywhere really involved in participating in real science, um, real science research, partnering with scientists to share your observations, to analyze data, and to make a real difference um, on issues that you care about. At SciStarter, we curate these resources for you. We are a globally acclaimed web site that houses and features tons, thousands of citizen science projects that you can look up. You can search by your location. You can search by the type of audience you want to serve. So we really encourage you also to sign up for SciStarter and get started on some citizen science projects today. So this National Community, National Citizen and Community Science Library Network, we have a long name, um, we have a couple of goals for this network. The first is to build your capacity as librarians. Maybe not all of you on the call today are librarians, but the, the main focus of this network is to build the capacity of librarians so that you can support your communities and in, in engaging in citizen science to inevitably broaden participation in science, right? That's the ultimate goal. It's to broaden participation and to help advance and accelerate scientific research. You work with a lot of diverse communities that might not be participating in science. And so our goal is to help you help them. Some of the benefits of this network, ongoing professional development, 
This is one of now four national webinars that we've hosted since September. We'll tell you a little bit about how to access those. We are here to support your um, capacity building and confidence and knowledge around citizen science. We've developed a ton of uh, materials like kit building guides and marketing resources for you to be able to build citizen science kits that your patrons can check out. We're always thinking about opportunities for grant funding um, and we'll, we'll bring that to the network. This is a place for you all as a, as a library community to come together around citizen science and help and support each other. We work with a ton of national organizations, community-based organizations like the Girl Scouts and the NASA Night Sky Network and 4-H. And so one of the goals is to also bring those folks to you. And then we will share our evaluation and data findings as well. By signing up, as Darlene put in the chat, um, you are kind of signing up to engage in this community, to build the kits, to promote, a, promote awareness of citizen science. We hope that you attend our webinars and our communities of practice, and that you know we are still learning about what this network needs. And we will be administering a survey in sometime in late spring to this network. And we really encourage you to participate in that so that we can shape next year's webinars and resources and future opportunities around things that you care about. We wanna be here for you. As I mentioned, there's a ton of ongoing support through this network. There are uh, online trainings that you can take. These are self-guided tutorials. The first anyone can take, even your library patrons, and you get a a digital badge that you can put on your LinkedIn once you complete that training. And we've developed a second training um, specifically for libraries on how to become community hubs for citizen science. And we are further developing this online kind of self-guided training series. We've developed a ton of resources like the kit building guides. We have tons of social media assets and marketing materials that are free and for you to use to promote citizen science. And then kits as well. As I mentioned, we have been doing this network webinar, these network webinars since September. This is our fourth one. Um, the first one was Introduction to Citizen Science. Then we talked about how to host a citizen science event, um, deeper dive into citizen science kits. And you can find all of those on our YouTube channel. So check that out. Um, also on the Library Network uh, website, we'll be adding the YouTube channel link there as well. Um, put in the chat if you've participated in one of our webinars in the past. I'm curious to see who has participated, or you can raise your hand virtually if that's possible. I'm curious who of the folks attending today have also attended in the past. Hi, William, Williamson, PA, welcome. I know some of these names, which is great seeing folks join multiple times. Christine says she has. Kathleen, wonderful. Sandra, awesome. So we'll tell you more about the network in, at the end of the call, but I'm going to turn it over to Darlene Cavalier, founder of SciStarter, to tell you about Citizen Science Month. Great to have everybody here. And I think, is it Marianne? Somebody, this is their third network uh, webinar. So thank you. You can start hosting these pretty soon, I bet. Um, Citizen Science Month is a wonderful opportunity to celebrate all things related to citizen science. And most of you know, and as Tara has explained, citizen science is a way for people to act upon issues that they're curious or concerned about. Don't need to have any formal training, no training at all in many cases. And um, it's a movement that is really uh, taking shape around the whole globe. Um, so Citizen Science Month gives us an opportunity to work with libraries and other partners to support you as you help facilitate um, introductions to citizen science among your library users and others. Thanks to support from the National Library of Medicine, we're able to provide lots of resources and materials to help you, some guidance and, and so forth. There were hundreds of events um, last year um, and it affected millions of people. Let's, let's actually take a look at the next slide. Some of the goals of Citizen Science Month are to, as we see here, increase awareness of what the heck citizen science is. If, believe it or not, uh, lots of people still don't know what citizen science is, which means we have a lot of work ahead of us um, until it gets to the point that everybody can start to see themselves as engaged in science. 
That's really what citizen science is. Again, it's different than traditional STEM or science outreach programs, which are designed to help educate somebody and teach them about science. In citizen science, we're actually helping to advance areas of important research by small acts, either making and sharing observations about nature or other things, um, or analyzing data. So sometimes scientists don't have enough data and they call upon the public to help them, or sometimes they have way too much data and they need help sorting through, classifying, analyzing that data. Those are, that's citizen science. And Citizen Science Month, again, gives us an excuse to really just shine a bright light on all the ways people can engage. One of the second goals is to support librarians to host programs and events. And you'll see from our friend Caroline, how many different ways you can get involved and participate in citizen science. It does not have to be a heavy lift, but if you wanted to go gangbusters, we have so much, um, so many resources to help you do that. And ultimately we're doing this because we wanna broaden participation not just in citizen science, but in science. Citizen science is the way that many people can engage, uh, but too often, as we all know, many people are still left out of these opportunities. Um, and so we passionately believe in making sure that there's no reason anybody anywhere can't at least feel empowered to get involved in real science. Next slide. Uh, these are just some of the outcomes from last month of citizen science and you know it was a trying month um, or a trying year still coming out of um, covid there and many libraries were closed so many of the events were virtual but not all of them we had 250 event events resulting in more than 350,000 data contributions to projects and we know that because at SciStarter we work with many different projects even if we're not hosting their data entry forms or hosting the project activities itself um, through support from the National Science Foundation, hundreds of projects report back to SciStarter how frequently people are engaged in their projects. And so we know there's at least 350 data contributions that were made because of Citizen Science Month and the events that mainly libraries hosted. Two thirds of the survey respondents, and we have all of our work is evaluated by our friends at Arizona State University have tuned in here too. Um, said that Citizen Science Month helped change the way they think about their libraries and the services you all provide. And so we're really happy to hear that too and hope that um, participants continue to leverage so many of the wonderful resources that libraries provide. 100% um, of the event organizers reported that Citizen Science Month matched or exceeded their expectations. And that's a hard, high bar to hit, but we're hoping that it's 100% again this year. And then more than a million people were reached through social media, um, which we're also very excited about. So it's becoming more, more mainstream. Next slide. And I'm gonna pass it off to my friend and colleague, Caroline Nickerson. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, and I'm so excited. I saw someone from Gainesville was calling in today and that's actually where I'm joining you for today, Gainesville, Florida. So um, good to have some Floridian representation on the line. But and. My name's Caroline. Uh, I am a citizen science enthusiast. Here's a picture of me actually outside at a public event um, doing the Globe Observer project with um, people who happen to walk up to the table. Um, and that's just one of the many projects that you can do with your community. Meredith says, yay, Gainesville. I love it. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, so why host a citizen science event at your library? Well, I think Darlene said it all that it's an amazing way to um, meaningfully make people part of the scientific process and to do real science together. Um, and there are, you know, data-backed reasons um, and success stories for why this might be a good idea for your community. Um, if you understand your community's interests, you can select citizen science projects that correspond with topics that they're passionate about and really give them um, a tangible role in uncovering new knowledge about these topics. That's really empowering. Um, and it, it's real science. Um, so for example, astronomy, right? If you, if you have a vibrant astronomy club at your library or community-based organization, um, you could do the Globe at Night project with your astronomy club and they could help uncover light pollution in your area and related impacts. And that could um, potentially make a difference in your community. Um, it also supports efforts to increase science learning. When people participate in that Globe at Night project, they're learning about different constellations. Um, there's a different constellation each month that people look at in the night sky to help investigate light pollution. 
Um, so, you know, while you're doing real science, you're also learning about the science. Um, and it enhances existing programs. Um, you know, you could make a completely new citizen science program. I've seen people do that and that goes great, but it also can dovetail really nicely with um, existing affin affinity groups or programming that you have. Um, it's a really great compliment. Um, and as you'll see on the right side of this slide, um, it was a crowd pleaser for participants last year who were surveyed um, for, uh, from various events um, around the world, actually. We had one event where we had people, um, participants from every continent, including Antarctica, which was pretty cool, uh, pre and presenters from every continent as well. Um, but people learn more. Um, they better understand the process of scientific discovery, um, and they learn how to participate in projects on their own, too, and, um, through these events. So we'll go to the next slide. All right, so we have a poll for you, because I know some of you are kind of uh, frequent uh, attenders, and you already have been part of this community. I'm just curious if you've hosted a Citizen Science Month event before. Um, if you haven't, there's no shame. It's coming right on up. And, um, you know, we say Citizen Science Month, but we really should say it's Citizen Science Year. You can have a Citizen Science program um, in your library or community-based organization anytime. April's just a great excuse, like Darlene said. All right, get your answers in. We'll give you a few more seconds. So three, two, and one. Let's close up this poll. All right, so it looks like the vast majority of you have not participated in Citizen Science Month before. Um, some of you have attended events and some of you have hosted events. That's okay if you've hosted an event before. Hopefully we share some tips and tricks um, and ideas that help you step up your game even more. If you participated, hopefully we give you some thoughts about how you can host. And if you're starting completely from scratch, well, you'll find what you need from this webinar too. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. Um, so one of the many resources we provide is the Library and Community Guide to Citizen Science. I tend to start here because um, it's comprehensive. Um, there are case studies from different libraries who have done citizen science programming. There are book lists. Um, there are survey templates, uh, grant opportunities, project recommendations, and so much more. Um, you can also just poke around on that citizensciencemonth.org page. Um, there really is a wealth of resources. Um, so I recommend investigating it and figuring out like, oh, you know, these particular social media templates will probably resonate with my community. Or um, maybe your community is all about pollinators and the pollinators book list um, that we have on citizensciencemonth.org is helpful for you. Or you read the library and community guide and you see what the Los Angeles Public Library did and you think, okay, I could do kit programming that's, some, that's somewhat similar. Um, this is, there's no right or wrong way to run a citizen science program. We're just trying to give you resources to empower your own passions and ideas for your community. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Um, so some essential elements, and some of you have seen this before, but uh, a, a professor of mine used to say, learning is like waves on a beach. Sometimes it feels you need it to hit again and again before it really resonates. And I don't think it hurts to cement the fundamentals and really hammer this home. This was in our event webinar um, last year. Uh, but this, this actually comes from Science Friday. They, they, they distilled these essential elements of programming, and it was really a game changer for me in thinking through how to communicate uh, why a citizen science project matters and give people a really compelling reason to participate. So the first thing is story. So when you're doing an event, everyone should leave that program knowing why they should care. They should have a really compelling reason for not only why they're in the virtual or physical room with you, but why they're thinking about this topic at all. Then there's experience. Um, it's really important to make things tangible for people, to give them something to look at. Even if you're on a webinar, you could have a video clip that they're able to actually see with their own eyes what's going on. Or if you're um, on camera, you and you're, you have a rain gauge, for example, you could demo how to make a measurement with the rain gauge. Um, and then action. Always give people something to do. Uh, your community, they're likely doers. They want to have the option to get involved if they so choose. So give them that clear call to action. Give them the means to participate in a citizen science project. And I like examples. So on the next slide, we're gonna show you some examples. Let's go to the next slide. So these are the elements, right? We have story, we have experience, and we have action. So let's say that you love pollinators and you know your community does too. 
Pollinators are responsible for one third of our food. They really, really matter. And you found a project on SciStarter called the Great Sunflower Project. It's a SciStarter affiliate, so um, people's contributions will track in their dashboard, which is awesome. If they sign up uh, for the Great Sunflower Project in the same email address they use to sign up for SciStarter, that's a little in the weeds, but just a useful tool that's available to you. Um, and you don't, it's not, you don't need sunflowers, it's any flowering plant. Before you even get to those details, you tell a story to your community. Let's Maybe you have a local, um, a pollinator expert from your local museum come in, or your local butterfly garden, or your local nursery even, and they talk about why pollinators matter, or you share a video from National Geographic, for example, about the beauty of pollinators that um, share some new imagery, and you explain why pollinator populations might be at risk um, in your area, and why it's important to study them. Then you give the experience. Uh, maybe you, uh, if you're on a virtual program, you're on, you go on your smartphone and you take people outside and you show them the flowering plants that are in their area. Um, or you, you um, might have um, some butterflies or pollinators in front of you that you show them. Um, and then you have the action. You can have people actually participate in the Great Sunflower Project. I've actually done this project on camera with people. Um, I'll uh, go outside, I'll be on the Zoom app on my smartphone and I'll sit there, look at this flowering plant. It doesn't have to be a sunflower, like we said, and I'll count the number of pollinators that visit this flowering plant in um, a minimum of five minutes period. Um, and then you report that data back to the Great Sunflower Project. SciStarter has some data sheets um, that you can download, but you can also just go straight to the web form. Um, and by doing that, you're helping the researchers of the Great Sunflower Project understand globally um, where pollinators um, might be doing well and where their populations might need some help. Um, and you can look on their map and see what's going on with pollinators in your area. And that's another compelling call to action for your community. You can say, hey, if enough of us observe this, then maybe we'll have a robust result about what's going on in our particular community. Um, and pollinators, it's such a great topic. If you're, you know, many of you haven't done a Citizen Science Month program before. Um, April, you know, it's a, a beautiful springtime. Uh, people like to get outside. Um, this may be the right project for your community and it's global. So I really encourage you to consider it. And it's easy to make it resonate with the story, you know, why pollinators matter, the experience, the things that you're able to demo for them on camera and the call to action. It can be as simple as participate in the Great Sunflower Project. And there's also a kit available on SciStarter um, as part of our library resources that you can have people check out. You don't need the kit to do the project, but it definitely augments the experience. Um, we'll go to the next slide. So I love examples if you haven't caught on to that already. And I think, I, I just wanna give a huge shout out to Lummi Island, Washington. Um, they really did such an amazing job for last Citizen Science Month of doing a multi-prong event. And you don't have to, you can just do one element of what they did and you'd already be doing an amazing job and engaging your community. But what they did is they partnered with multiple community organizations, including their island library, to do a webinar um, with an expert um, that they found through SciStarter um, to talk about conservation and marine debris prevention. So that was the story part. Uh, and then after the webinar, they had people come to the library and engage in a beach cleanup. Um, and they kind of coupled experience and action together. Um, so they went out and they tracked debris with citizen science to report incidences of plastics um, and other pollution to help get some data-driven solutions um, and look for patterns on their beaches in the library. And then people were able to come back to the library and there were citizen science displays, there were books they could check out, and there were other projects too. They didn't just do marine debris, they moved people to like pollinator projects and bird watching projects. It really jump-started a bunch of citizen science programming for them. Um, so even if you just had a book display or a shelf talker, or you just did one project, or you just did one online event, you'd be doing great, or you could do all of the above. Um, the website we have up here, scistarter.org forward slash NLM, they found um, resources there, and you can too if you want to do a debris tracker citizen science project. Um, and it doesn't have to be on the beach. I know it's called Marine Debris Tracker, but you can actually participate anywhere in the world to look for litter and plastic pollution. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, 
Um, another example, just to show you some of the diversity events. So we've worked with the Princeton University Library before. I wanted to give them a shout out because um, they were able to use their computer lab um, in 2019 um, to engage in a citizen science game day. They did the Stall Catchers project as well as the Snapshot Safari project. Um, and they had people classify data online. Stall Catchers is a project where you watch videos of blood vessels and you classify them as stalled or flowing. And by making that simple annotation, you're helping Alzheimer's researchers answer questions about this disease. Um, so you're looking at videos of mouse brains and classifying these blood vessels as stalled or flowing. Um, but, and there are a number of gaming projects that we have featured on SciStarter, where by engaging in them, you're either um, building something or classifying something. So the Eterna project, for example, by participating in that project, you're actually building puzzles to help researchers um, synthesize RNA-based vaccines. Um, so that's, that's a very cool project. It's a little more challenging than stall catchers. So um, if your community is up for a challenge, like maybe you have a team group who's just like particularly good at solving puzzles, that might be a great project for them. And Foldit is another project. It's a gaming-based project. It can be a little complicated, um, but you're able, um, they're focusing on COVID-19 at the moment. And you can, um, engage in this puzzle-based game to address COVID-19. Um, and there are a number of different gaming-based projects on SciStarter that are completely online that you could do in the computer lab to classify or analyze or um, build or come up with some sort of prototype of data. Um, but I mean, I, I think those three that I just outlined are a great place to start. And Stall Catchers is one of my favorite. Uh, favorites. So definitely discover that on SciStarter.org forward slash NLM, even if you just want to participate yourself. Um, and then a fun fact about the Princeton University Library, you know, they did their in-person programming in 2019, and then in 2020, they transitioned to an online event where they were still able to engage in citizen science games and do Snapshot Safari, which is a project where you classify animals online to help researchers monitor their populations. Um, so, you know, you can be creative and roll with the punches in this world to still um, engage people in impactful programming. We'll go to the next slide. Um, so there, like I said, there's no right or wrong way to do a program. We're just giving you ideas and take the ones that you think make sense for your community. So bioblitzes are really popular with libraries and community-based organizations um, because you can go outside and basically document the biodiversity, the species, the plants and animals in your community. Um, and uh, this works really well with library kits, especially like if you ha have people check out special lenses or special um, biodiversity kits. Um, SciStarter has templates along those lines. Um, and you can, by having people engage at once, you can have some collective impact. You can really understand um, the, the makeup, the composition of the species that are around you in your own community. Um, we've talked a little bit about walking cleanup tours. So while you're you know, classifying debris, um, and helping researchers understand those patterns and the data. You can also pick up the debris. So it's a very nice civic engagement project coupled with some real science there. Um, and you can do the IC change project. Um, that's another one of my favorites. It's on that SciStarter.org forward slash NLM page I mentioned is a um, great project for libraries where you can um, engage your community in um, monitoring weather, climate, and environmental conditions. And that project is, um, very accessible to people of all ages because all you have to do is describe what you see and describe its impact on you. Um, and by doing that, something as simple as that, you're able to help researchers um, and journalists understand um, trends in the environment. Um, I often participate in the IC Change Project when I'm in Miami. Um, if I see um, water piling up on the sidewalk, I'll snap a picture of it, upload it to IC Change because they have a flooding investigation in Miami. And they always really appreciate my data points and helping them understand trends and the impact on the community. Um, and we talked about game days. Um, I think Stall Catchers is a great pick, but there are so many amazing gaming projects. Definitely pick the right one for your community. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And we talked about kits. Um, so like I said, a kit is not required to participate, but it really helps and it really augments the experience. So the Exploring Biodiversity Kit is what you see on the screen. Um, and uh, that um, often consists of uh, some of the materials that SciStarter's provided. You can adapt those for your community. 
and people could check out a photo lens that they attach to their cell phone to take their contributions to the next level, um, to get an even better picture of the plants and animals in your community to help classify them and understand what species are occurring and where. Um, iNaturalist is one of the most popular projects for this, for observing biodiversity. And there have been some amazing contributions on there. Um, people, I remember in 2020, um, in Washington, DC, a student, a 13-year-old student, um, rediscovered a species in um, the middle of the city um, in Rock Creek Park that hadn't been seen in like 60 years. Um, so, you know, you never know what you're going to find and what you're, you'll observe with your own eyes and that you can document um, through citizen science. And there are many, the um, Globe at Night project for astronomy, there's a kit that corresponds with that. Um, there are um, observing pollinators kits um, that we talked, we briefly hinted at that I urge you to explore. Just like click around and see what you think would fit best for you. Um, and like I said, if you don't have the resources to build a kit, no sweat, you can still do these projects with your community. We'll go to the next slide. Carolyn, I just wanted to follow up quickly and just remind people one of the webinars that we actually last a couple of weeks ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago was that we hosted a deep dive on how to build citizen science kits. Um, this kit guide is we tried like from soup to nuts to help you understand what materials you need, what um, the printed and promotional stuff looks like. So check out that webinar. Um, Emily can put the YouTube link to our webinar page, um, our, our YouTube page in there. But I just wanted to follow up and say, there's a lot more around this particular resource. Awesome. I just saw in the chat, someone asked, how do we reassure patrons who are afraid of getting things wrong? That's the perfect segue for this slide. Um, if you want to put people at ease, have them participate in SciStarter.org forward slash training the Foundations of Citizen Science Training created by instructional designers at Arizona State University. There are also resources on this page um, for you to facilitate an introduction to citizen science for your communities. And there's a library training um, for library staff that you can participate in as well um, that comes after this. But you can actually have your patrons participate directly in this training and they can earn a badge. That being said, for projects like stall catchers, for example, that is part of this training, by the way, just to give a quick, quick plug for it. Um, but stall catchers, they um, use machine learning techniques to basically rank your contributions. So if you tend to agree more often with the rest of the people classifying a particular blood vessel, um, then your contributions are weighted as more accurate. Um, so you can participate without fear of being wrong because the system is working in the back end to protect you. And they have um, tested the system over and over again. Um, and they have found that the crowdsourced answer is actually more accurate than that in the lab. And this machine, and you might be wondering, I mentioned machine learning, well, why aren't robots doing all the classifications for stall catchers? The answer is robots aren't good enough yet. We still need your human eyes to classify those blood vessels, but what they can do is help you out a little bit by um, weighting the contributions and figuring out what the right answer is based on um, the number of people classifying a certain blood vessel one way or another. Um, and many projects have built those data quality controls in, um, similar data quality controls, so you can participate without fear. The best way to learn is just to do. And uh, one way you can start doing things is going to that training page and earning your badge, and I'm encouraging your community to earn their badges as well. We'll go to the next slide. Um, so some sample itineraries. We're, once again, we're just trying to spark some ideas for you. Um, maybe the Millbridge Public Library will inspire you. They hosted a get to know citizen science session after they did a bird hike with the eBird project to observe birds in their area. Um, and they offered kits, books, SciStarter.org demonstrations. Um, maybe the Fletcher Free Library inspires you. Um, they did some in-person programs in 2021 um, and they distributed some kits um, and they engaged people of all ages. So that's another great thing about citizen science. You can do it in a story time. You can do it with you know, working professionals or you can do it with a senior group. It's really for all ages. Um, and you can partner with um, or community organizations like local senior centers to expand your programming. Um, so no right or wrong way to do this. Just like look at your community partners and figure out, okay, I think people tend to like birds. Let's do a bird hike. Or um, uh, we have an opportunity for outdoor programming. Let's do it on this particular day. Uh, let's go to the next slide. 
Um, so if you're feeling a little daunted, like, oh, I don't know if I can do a bird hike right now, that is okay. For in April, you could just celebrate by using SciStarter's templates to put some displays up. Or you could um, put the Field Guide to Citizen Science, um, that's a, the book that Darlene, SciStarter's founder, co-authored. Um, you could put that in your collections and encourage people to check it out. Um, or you can, um, like we've been talking about, affinity groups, you could just bring citizen science projects that you know will resonate with a particular affinity group. Maybe you could print out their instructions from scistarter.org forward slash NLM and just have them participate on their own. Or you could just post about it on social media from your library page. There's no right or wrong way to do this. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so I thought um, the Walport Public Library, they did a ton of things for Citizen Science Month, but I particularly like their displays because they used SciStarter's templates, but really made them their own. So they took those Citizen Science Month logos, um, that branding or social media toolkits and just ran with them. And they had shelf talkers all throughout their library spotlighting different featured projects from SciStarter. I hear someone unmuting. All right, we'll, go, we'll just keep going. Next slide. Um, and we mentioned story times. So the Walport Public Library did that as well. Um, the book that the, um, uh, the library staff member is holding is um, listed in the Field Guide to Citizen Science and on our book list on citizenscienceMonth.org. And of course, we would be remiss uh, not to spotlight the Field Guide to Citizen Science. It's pretty much SciStarter in a book. Um, it's everything you need to join the Citizen Science Brigade and start making a difference. And it's also just a very pretty book. Um, I have it on my desk. Um, and I think it would be um, a really enjoyable introduction for your community. And if you know a lot about Citizen Science, you can also learn something from it too. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. Um, so another option, if you don't want to do a full-scale event, but you want to embed citizen science into your community, you can put the project finder on your library's website. So we've mentioned all the different projects that are featured on SciStarter. So a researcher or a project leader adds a project to SciStarter when they're seeking volunteers, and passionate and curious people like yourselves come to SciStarter when they're seeking to make a difference, and they find the right project for them by searching by activity, like projects I can do on a hike are searching by topic. Maybe they're really curious about the brain and they just search the word brain and a project pops up for them. Or maybe they only want projects where they can track the number and frequency of their contributions in their SciStarter account dashboard. You can search for just SciStarter affiliate projects on the full project finder on the site, but you can put a mini version, a widget um, on your own website by using the free code that we provide. Um, so we've a number of libraries have done that and it seems to have worked out really well for them. It just gives people another means of discovering these projects where they can turn their curiosity about the world into real impact. We'll go to the next slide. Um, and that's the, the main project finder I mentioned. Oh, I want to give a quick plug. You can also search by relevant sustainable development goal. That's new. Um, that was a, a new partnership with an organization that it was very meta. They had citizen scientists classifying the projects on SciStarter by sustainable development goals so other citizen scientists could discover them. Um, and the SDGs are just different things, um, different goals by the United Nations about making the world better and more sustainable. And there are many citizen science projects that correspond with those goals. You can also search by age group. Maybe you, um, you have some kiddos in the house and you wanna um, engage in citizen science with different age groups. You can search for projects that have you know, classified themselves as being good for a certain age group. Um, some projects like Eterna can be a little bit more complicated and you might want to be, you know, 13 and up to solve those puzzles. But other projects like the Great Sunflower Project, the only skill you really need is how to count. You know, you just have to be able to count the number of pollinators that visit that particular flowering plant. Um, so that project has identified itself as being eligible for people of all ages, but, you know, friendlier for people who may not have like advanced problem solving skills as of yet. Um, and that project also has a really cool coloring sheet um, that SciStarter helped design um, that you can find on its SciStarter project profile and on SciStarter.org forward slash NLM as well. So please explore the fi project finder to your heart's content. You can also search for the SciStarter affiliates. If you want to keep track of your contributions, there's a filter for that on the finder. And if you find something really cool, don't be afraid to email us and tell us about your experience. We, that's one of our favorite things is hearing from you all. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. <laughs> 
Um, so we mentioned introducing projects to affinity groups. I just wanted to show you some more ways that different people can engage. Um, you know, you can be in the library, you can be outside the library, you can be on your local trail, you can be outside at night. There are all, you can just be in the computer lab, all different places, all different ages. It's whatever is right for your community. Let's go to the next slide. Um, you can also tune in to um, other events. So in April, we're going to have a select number of events that we're um, featuring as, you know, global opportunities for people to tune in and really enjoy it. So you can find those on SciStarter and maybe host a watch party with your library. Um, we wanted to give a shout out to PBS's Ken Burns, Ben Franklin. Um, if they have an online citizen science month event because um, believe it or not, the founding fathers were citizen scientists as well. I think um, citizen science is really in line with the American spirit of innovation and discovering new things. Um, so you could have a watch party for that film release um, and tune into their citizen science month programming. Um, Discover and Astronomy Magazines, they have been big parts of Citizen Science Month, and they'll be gearing up for it again. Um, you, uh, or you can also, there are old recordings of our events with them that you could host a watch party anytime you want. Those recordings are really evergreen with different astronomy-related projects and projects that are for the curious people um, in the world who, who love those magazines. And the National Library of Medicine, we have a lot of events with them um, because the All of Us Research Program is a really exciting precision medicine study. Um, and we actually have one coming up this month that you could participate in. So just explore citizensciencemonth.org. There are many ways you can tune in and invite your community to as well. We'll go to the next slide. Perfect. I think our next slide is a poll, Caroline. And I just wanted to pause here because you have just given us so many amazing examples of things. I'm curious what everyone's thinking right now um, as you're digesting this information that, that Caroline is presenting to you. Thank you, Caroline. You are such an expert in this. We, it's an invaluable resource to have Caroline on the line who just has done so much for Citizen Science Month. So Emily, why don't you launch this poll? And, and please feel free to elaborate in the chat as well. How might you participate in Citizen Science Month just hearing some of the examples that Caroline um, presented. And I can't see the poll, unfortunately, so I can't read the options out loud, but <laughs> that's all right. Somebody, will, Caroline, you'll have to tell us what the poll says. Yeah, um, I mean, once we close the poll. I'm seeing all the options come in. It looks like we have a clear front runner, but I won't spoil okay. it yet. Okay. Oh, I think everybody's answering. Great. All right, should we close the poll? Yeah, we'll give you all like two more seconds. Okay, two um, more seconds. You tell us one, Caroline. <laughs> okay, last chance, everybody. I think we have a few more folks who haven't answered, but we're almost there. All right, three, two, and one. Let's close the poll. So, right, what was, like, what, what, yeah, go for it. Looks like the clear front runner is people want to host our event and event our program, which is great. You can add that to SciStarter. Even if it's just for your local community, like you're, you know, let's say you're in Gainesville, Florida, and you're having people come to the Alachua County Public Library, add that up to SciStarter because you can use our People Finder to invite all the users in Alachua County to your event. And also, it helps us know what's going on. Like, it's a really a service to the field. So we can celebrate you, include you in our evaluation efforts, and improve future programming for other people. So add your event or program to SciStarter no matter what. And also it seems like a lot of folks want to promote virtual events. Um, we have people who want to build awareness of citizen science through bookmarks. So I think people will be using our free materials, which is great. Um, we have people who want to pick a project and engage their library users. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, go to that scistar.org forward slash NLN page. Any of those projects would be a great fit for a library or community-based organization. And then we have some quite a few people who aren't sure but want to do something. You can just do a project on your own too. You can just celebrate as an individual. That's totally fine. In the chat too, Caroline, um, Marianne says, thinking about hosting a bio blitz at the library. Um, Fawn says she's already working on a huge project in April where they'll be doing litter pickups and litter study tracking it at the library. What's a good project to tie into Fawn's um, idea for a project? Marine debris uh, tracker. That's marine next, debris tracker yep, and that's found on the page that caroline was showing called uh scistarter.org forward slash nlm that's for the national library of medicine there's a group of curated projects there with step-by-step -step instructions and it's about environmental and human health and one is specifically about plastics pollution and all kinds of litter 
I would definitely recommend that one for your event. Awesome. Turning it back over to you, Caroline. Yeah, let's, uh, um, we'll leave some time for questions at the end, but I want to do a quick resource roundup to get your, your brains firing as we close up. So use these templates, use these bookmarks, these flyers, these graphics. If you aren't printing them out for your library, they also um, make great social media shareable materials. So we invite you to use them um, and make a difference for your community with them. We'll go to the next slide. Um, there are also certificate templates that we've provided if you want to celebrate your community's participation and give them projects. There are interactive posters you can print out. So we see we have seen people print out these poster templates and they have questions on them and you, people can put sticky notes. That tends to be very popular. Um, and there are buttons. The buttons are always a crowd pleaser. We have those templates up on citizenscienceMonth.org forward slash resources. Um, distribute those buttons to your community during Citizen Science Month. And we'll go to the next slide. Um, and then, of course, social media. It's a huge asset. The digital world is here to stay. You can use these frames for profile pictures. You could even use it for your library's profile picture on social media for April. And there are a number of graphics that um, can be a jumping off point for you for celebrating Citizen Science Month online. And you can find all of this at citizenscienceMonth.org forward slash resources. Get the buttons, the social media graphics, the printables, the, gra um, the, uh, the logos. All of that is for you on citizenscienceMonth.org forward slash resources. And even more things that I haven't even had time to mention, they're all up there. We'll go to the next slide. Um, and of course, like I mentioned earlier, you, can, you don't have to wait for a live event to do a watch party. You can do watch parties or share content from our YouTube. Um, SciStarter has had a number of live stream programs with different subject matter experts from around the world on Facebook and YouTube. Um, so definitely go to that YouTube playlist. That's a great place to start. Um, some how-to videos that different projects have made, for example, are featured there. And if you go to our YouTube and Facebook pages, um, we have interviews we've done with subject matter experts. Um, some libraries have sent us recordings of their programs, um, like the Los Angeles Public Library sent us a number of their recordings that we, we put up online, like their story times. Um, you can watch those with your community. One example that I thought was really cool was um, we did a program with um, some citizen scientists and documentary filmmakers from Canada. These citizen scientists had discovered a new aurora in the night sky that they had named Steve. Um, and it was a very spirited, fun Q&A with, um, with um, scientists from NASA on the line in conversation with these citizen scientists. Um, and um, NASA actually had um, a watch party with a number of their employees um, after that event where they showcased that recording. Um, so, you know, you can really, um, I hope these recordings are a great evergreen resource for you. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. Next steps. All right, let's keep it going. So we have office hours every Thursday. Um, it's usually um, myself and my colleague Robin on the line for those. Those are at 8 a.m. and 11 a.m. ET. Um, we're also available via email at info at um, If you want to stay in the loop about the latest resources, you can sign up for facilitator updates at citizenscienceMonth.org forward slash mailing list. And then please, the earlier the better, just so um, we can help support you and advertise your event on social media. Um, and so you can use our people finder, add your event to SciStarter. We really want to include you in this global effort. Um, and if your event is as simple as, you know, we are distributing citizen science bookmarks all month long, you can add that to SciStarter too, and you can select the event as lasting for a month. We just want to celebrate you. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, all right, I'm gonna hand it over to um, Tara to close us out. Yeah, thank you again, Caroline. You just know so much. And please attend those, those office hours that um, Caroline and Robin are on. You can also email. I know we, we there's kind of two emails. There's the info at SciStarter. There's also the library network at SciStarter email. We check all of those emails and we correspond with each other through those emails. So whatever email you, you send your question to, um, we'll be able to, to help you out. Um, yeah, we'll put the, that link in the chat as well, Christine. I'm going to turn it over to Emily to take us through the um, upcoming opportunities uh, before we get to questions. Great. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Caroline. Um, so we just wanted to let you know about a few upcoming webinars and opportunities where you can engage with um, the uh, library network and also uh, learn more about Citizen Science Month. Um, so we do have another professional development uh, webinar, which is actually more 
about um, celebrating Citizen Science Month and celebrating citizen science in libraries. So we are going to invite some libraries to present on this webinar and share with uh, the library network and their communities about um, the exciting work happening in libraries around citizen science. So that webinar is on April 27th. Uh, we hope you'll join us. You can sign up for that webinar. We're going to send a link in the follow-up email, um, and you can also find a link on the library network page. I'll just add it to the chat. Um, so you, you should register in advance for that, but we'll, we hope you'll join us in April for that webinar. Um, and then as you'll see on the slide, there's a lot of other Citizen Science Month events that we hope you'll join us for. Um, you can view those at citizensciencemonth.org. Emily, I was just going to add one thing, which I, which I just thought of. Um, there's already some amazing ideas happening in the chat, and um, folks have already been engaging in this work. You are interested in presenting on that webinar, potentially, um, and have something really cool that you are doing around citizen science at your library, and you want to showcase it nationally to other librarians, send us an email at library network at, at um, I always get this wrong, library network at scistarter.org. Thank you, Emily. Um, and we will reach back out to you um, and see if, if we can have you present on this webinar. We are still looking for presenters. Definitely. We're hoping to showcase a lot of exciting uh, work happening around citizen science on that webinar. So if you're interested, just let us know. Um, so we will now take some time for questions. Um, one final kind of to do, we are hoping that you can complete a survey. Um, so that we can learn from you um, what was successful in this webinar, what you learned, um, and so that we can hopefully make the next webinar even better. So here is the link uh, to that survey. We hope you'll complete that for us. Um, we'll also send it in the follow-up email. So if you don't, if you miss the link now, don't worry, we'll send it back out to you. Um, but we have about eight minutes now, so we will take some questions in the chat. Um, can I answer one? I never ahead. even realized that's such a good question. The difference between an event and a program, the pro the project, sorry, the projects that we have in SciStarter are the science projects looking for help. The events that we're directing you to are events at libraries, at schools, at national parks and so forth that help to engage people. That's the difference. So we're asking you to add your events there. We definitely don't expect you to create a citizen science or a research project. But when you add, so you add your project, if you were a scientist, you'd add your project to the project database. The event link that we're adding here is for you to tell us a little bit about your event, send us a link of where people would RSVP. Um, you, it's basically four or five fields. And that helps us, as Caroline mentioned, understand what's happening around the country for Citizen Science Month, and we help promote it. So even if you're just looking for a very, very local audience, there's a lot of people who use SciStarter and we can help them know in that exact area that your event is coming up. If your event is online and open to all. Um, and then also if Caroline or somebody is looking at Leanne's note, she's unable to sign up for updates. So maybe just take a look at that link. Um, anyway, that's why it's important to add your event. And if you're still planning it, which you probably are, please reach out to us and we're happy to help you do that. But thank you for that. I've got to really remember the difference between the uh, projects and the events when we're talking about adding um, your events to that database. That's a really good point, Darlene, right? These events are for your either, you know, virtual or in-person audiences to get familiar with a project, for example. Um, and so we want to know about what, what kind of events or even if you're I mean, even if you're doing something that's not an event um shoot us a message in the sci starter email and let us know how you're engaging your folks in citizen science send us pictures we love that or tag us on social media right if you're only doing a book display for for example let us know tag us on social media we love to see all types of engagement around citizen science uh are there any other questions in the chat i'm just trying to see Judy says, do you have any make and take and make projects? So as Darlene mentioned, right, these projects that um, these that scientists have developed are real science research. Um, so we don't really, we don't develop any of the projects. We rely on our scientists to um, share their resources with us. But we have built, we have developed these build a kit guides that help making, make doing the project uh, more accessible. Uh, exactly. So for example, the project, 
observing pollinators, the kit that we suggest you build has binoculars in it. Um, it has all of the data collection sheets that you might need. Um, it has some local pollinator guides, right? We're not giving you those materials, but we have provided you a list of what materials would make a good kit. Um, the globe at night uh, measuring light in the night kit has suggest uh, one of the one of the tools that you need to participate in that project is a light meter. Um, and so we have developed a kit, uh, build a kit guide that has the link to the light meter. It has a link to a um, red light flash, uh, like a night flashlight, all of the maybe like a star finder that you might need things to make the project more accessible to your audiences. So if they're like, oh, I don't know how to collect this data. You're like, yeah, you can take this kit. This kit will make it easy. Any other questions? And that's a great point. Darlene says you can make a kit of projects that we haven't necessarily um, made a kit for. And let us know how you're making those kits, how you're making the projects more accessible to your audiences. Do you have a debris tracker kit with a, um, a grabber and, and some other materials? Let us know. All of these things are, are really great opportunities for us to learn and expand our resources. And I will say really quickly um, on the topic of events, we're defining the term event pretty broadly for Citizen Science Month. So like if you're going to have a book display up through April 1st to April 30th, you could add that as an event to SciStarter. We just want to celebrate all the different libraries and community-based organizations that are participating. That being said, if you're doing a specific moment in time event, like let's say you're doing a webinar for an hour, or you're doing a three hour bio blitz, add that to SciStarter too. And you could just you know, set the time to be like April 1st, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And that's totally fine as well. Um, just anything you have, add that. We would love to celebrate it. And um, like Tara and Darlene said, the projects are um, more ongoing things that researchers or project leaders add. Events, um, that's the, the event side of SciStarter is the space to celebrate your efforts where you're getting people involved in particular projects or some sort of citizen science effort. Thank you, Caroline. I, that's great to know. I didn't know you could add like non-event type of programming. I think, yes, it's a great point, to, a great way to collect any information regarding what folks are doing. Um, there are some other great examples or of like make and takes. I think absolutely you could, you could do like a, a make and take alongside of a citizen science project, or maybe a, as a way to engage people um, before they go out and do the project. For example, someone said making bird seed ornamentals and then going out and observing birds and, and collecting that data through the iNaturalist app. Um, doing a cloud in a jar, I love that. And then you can go do the Globe Cloud Observer project. So these are great ways to make the projects even more fun and extend the learning and get everybody involved. There was another question about um, what social media tags and handles they should use. Um, Caroline, I don't know if you want to add them to the chat or what's best in terms of hashtag for Citizen Science Month. Yeah, hashtag SitSci Month is a good one. Um, we also have an at SitSci Month handle on Twitter and Instagram that people can sign up for takeovers for. Um, and of course, always tag SciStarter. You can use the hashtag Citizen Science or hashtag SitSci, but Hashtag sit sci month is a winner and please tag us and stuff. We always love that. You know, that that came up on another call recently about which hashtags folks should be using. And that, I think that's a sign for us as a team to go back and maybe develop a social media toolkit or some one pager um, on the various platforms that we operate, hashtags that we encourage. Um, so we can definitely take that back and, and create something um, for the network. Thank you for that. All right, I just wanted to wrap this up in our last minute by thanking you again. Please join the library network. Um, we will, we're gonna be cross promoting Citizen Science Month through the network, right? Citizen Science Month goes beyond just libraries, but it, libraries are such a big focus of it. So our next newsletter coming out in a week will feature some great resources for Citizen Science Month. So please sign up for that. And Emily put a link in the chat. And, and I, um, if you can add it again, Emily, to our evaluation survey for today's webinar, we're super, super interested in um, what this community wants and needs out of these webinars, what we can do to better support you. But again, thank you so much for joining and we will see you at our next webinar. Thanks.